Welcome back to the channel. In this video, we'll do a high yield review of abstract questions and has now been appearing on USMLE exams. So it's important to understand how to work through these questions as well as what they're looking for when they're giving you these questions as well as how to efficiently approach them. So we'll do an abstract problem with a few practice questions built in. We'll talk about the basics of abstract questions, how to approach them generally, and we'll also review the topics that we discuss here in this abstract. If you like this sort of content, feel free to drop a like and add a comment below as well. We'll go ahead and get started. So here's the abstract on the left and the question on the right. This is typically how it's presented. Usually you can scroll through and highlight in the abstract, and then you'll usually have a series of questions on the right based on the abstract. So I'll pause here for a minute while you read through the abstract. All right, so we'll talk about the abstract here. I won't read through it in its entirety, but I will highlight a few things. So this is related to moderate to severe asthma, and we're testing a new monoclonal antibody here in this study. The study is referenced below for anybody interested. So in the methods, they describe that it's a phase two randomized double-blinded placebo-controlled trial. It's measuring this medication at three dose levels over this treatment period. And then the results are the most important things findings here. Um, so they measured at the three different doses. They talk about exactly how long each is at each dose. And then they talk about annualized asthma exacerbation rates here, which are listed below. And then they also describe how those rates changed compared to each group with p-values. And then they talk additionally about pre-bronchodilator forced expiratory volume in one second. So those seem to be the study measures of interest here. And they also mention a little bit about adverse events here at the end as well. So let's go through these questions. So on the right, we have, based on the structure of the research study as described in the abstract, which of the following best described the awareness of the participant, trial agent staff, and data analyzer with regards to treatment and placebo allocations? So we have A, B, C, and D. A, only the participant is blinded. We got B, all three are blinded. C, participant and trial agent staff are blinded. And D, trial agent staff and data analyzer are blinded. So the answer here is C. So this is a concept that they describe in the methods. So if you remember back in the methods, they described a double-blinded placebo-controlled trial. So they'll oftentimes reference in these abstract questions direct comments that they mention in the abstract and you require you to use that information in addition to your own knowledge to make an answer to a question possible. So the participant being blinded is single blinded. So that's true of A, B, and C, and not D. And then the trial agent staff being blinded makes it a double blinded study, which is the only one that's there as an option is C. If you notice with B, the data analyzer is also blinded, which would be a triple blinded con randomized controlled st study, which is not what's described here in the methods. So that's the answer to this first one. We'll move on to the next one. In the entirety of the study, the researchers mentioned that included participants were also required to have a history of at least two asthma exacerbations that led to systemic glucocorticoid treatment. Which of the following best describes this component of the study? A, restriction, B, matching, C, stratification, D, randomization, or E, statistical significance? The answer to this one is A, restriction. So this is an, another point they can do. They can sometimes reference material and add it just for the sake of creating a question. So the way it's set in the entirety of the study means that it wasn't described in the abstract. So they're not giving you extra hints that you can go look for extra information in the abstract. They're just requiring you to have an outside component of knowledge and testing that knowledge. So A, restriction here, we'll talk more about this in detail, but requiring participants to be included that only fit a specific subset of criteria of the target population is the definition of restriction. You're restricting the target population to a specific subset of individuals in, those popula in that population. So that's what restriction is. We'll talk about matching, stratification, and randomization here in a few slides. But again, statistical significance is not what they're looking at here. That's determined based on confidence intervals, p-values, and alpha levels, which we'll talk about also in a little bit. So let's move on to the final portion of this question. Based on the results of this study, which of the following conclusions can be made about the effect of this new monoclonal antibody on moderate to severe asthma? We have A, 
Analyzed asthma exacerbation rates decreased in low and high dose, but not in medium dose. We have B, exacerbation rates decreased amongst all doses. We have C, no decrease at any dose compared to placebo. And D, we have pre-bronchodilator FEV1 only increased in those receiving a high dose compared to placebo. The answer to this one is B. So this one requires you to look through the results, look at what the results are telling you and compare that to the interpretations you see listed here. So B states that annualized exacerbation rates were decreased amongst all doses. And if you look in the results, it says thus, exacerbations in the respective groups were lower by X, X, and X percent in, in all of the groups compared to the placebo groups. So you can see that there wasn't any difference in necessarily between the groups themselves that they found, but they found that each group significantly was decreased compared to placebo. A, the wrong portion of that question was that the medium dose was left out, which there was also significantly difference, a significant difference there between the medium dose and placebo. C said that there wasn't any difference, which we know that from the p-values and the numbers they listed there, there was significance. And then D, FEV1 was increased only in those receiving high dose. We know that that's not true as well. It was only, it was between all the doses. So we know that A, C, and D had some component of the question that was wrong. So let's talk briefly about how I would approach these questions. And then we'll talk about the content actually of the questions themselves. And then we'll summarize with some high yield points on abstract questions. So I always recommend first to skim the question and reference relevant portions of the abstract. If you think back to the portion that was asking you about the blinding status, if you just look at the ref reference, the methods, you could see that it's saying it's a double blinded study. And from there, you could answer that question. So if you skim the question first, this is before even reading the abstract, then reference the abstract, you know that the blinding is gonna be referenced in the method section, that, that sort of thing. You save yourself valuable time. These questions tend to take a lot longer than normal questions. You have to read through an entire excerpt. And so that'll save you a lot of time. Point two is watch for subtle disclaimers, notes, or asterisks. So there wasn't, weren't any present in this abstract, but keep in mind, if they put an asterisk or an exception or a note at the bottom, they will oftentimes make a question and reference that note without directly saying so. And if you don't notice that exception, you'll they will put a, a answer choice that directly targets those who haven't noticed that exception and it'll really tempt you into choosing that choice. So watch out for those disclaimers at the bottom. It'll usually be referenced at the bottom. Three, remember, when you answer each question, keep in mind the context of the research study. So they can oftentimes put questions and frame them in the style of a different study, for example, a cohort study. And so you know that the context of that for an RCT would be different than a cohort study. And they can sometimes mislead you with answer choices that aren't in the context of an RCT. So keep in mind the differences and the context that they're looking for in the question itself. And then four, I always recommend when you complete the questions, take a step back when you finish the two or three questions in an abstract, skim through the abstract again, look at your answers, and does do your answer choices align with the abstract's depiction of the study? So a lot of times in these questions, they're wanting you to not only get the questions right, but they're wanting you to see what the research were, researchers were getting at and also the final points of the study. And usually the answers can sometimes tell a story of the study. They try and balance out the questions. So there may be one targeting the methods. They may, there may be one getting you to interpret the results. And there may be one asking you about potential biases in the study. And those sorts of things all together fit into a story. And they want you to sort of align these views. And if you can pull that all together, then you can feel a lot more confident that the answers that you chose were the correct answers. So let's move on here and talk about the actual content that we just discussed in these questions. So the first topic we'll talk about is blinding and randomized controlled trials. So blinding as depicted on the right here, blinding is metaphorical. You don't physically blind somebody, but what it does is it prevents participants and researchers and the analyst from being aware of who's receiving the treatment and who's receiving a placebo. So in a single blinded study, the participant is blinded. So if user A and user B are both included in the study, but user A knows they're getting the treatment regimen, they may believe that they're going to see an improvement. They may also do something outside of the study to try and achieve that improvement. 
So what you're doing by blinding them and they have no idea if they're receiving the placebo or the treatment is you reduce the placebo effect, which is where expectations or things that you do when you have expectations change and influence the outcomes of the study. And there've been multiple studies that show the placebo effect can be a powerful thing. When you increase that to double blinded, you not only blind the participant, but you also prevent the researcher. So this is the person collecting the data itself from knowing the participants groups. If the researcher knew, then they could potentially influence the course of the study because they may be incentivized to find significant results. And if they know, they may influence which participant fits in which group. So double-blinded studies are the gold standard because you blind the participant, you blind the researcher, and there's no one directly involved in the data process that is aware of the groups. And that's the best case scenario. And this is what double blinding does is it reduces observer bias imposed by the researcher if they ask you that question. And triple blinded, last but not least, is when the data analyst is also blinded. So all the three, the participant, the researcher, and the analyst are blinded. But again, the person analyzing the study needs to know which group is the treatment group and which is the placebo because they're actually analyzing the study. So this is less realistic in real life. So double blind is the gold standard for this reason. Triple blind could potentially be a little better, but in real life, you need someone to analyze the data and that person or persons needs to know which group fits into which category. Let's move on here. These are methods to reduce, reduce confounding, which we talked about previously. So you can split these by what occurs in the study design. So when you're creating the study itself, and then what occurs in the analysis when you've collected your data and you're analyzing the results. So let's start with study design. So randomization, the core point of a randomized controlled trial. So you randomly allocate people to the treatment and the control group. No one is choosing these. They are randomly allocated by a computer algorithm. And so what that does is you directly randomize all of the other confounding variables. So age, gender, race, income status, you're not choosing based on any of those factors. You're just randomly selecting. And so those theoretically are randomly distributed between both groups. And so they should be pretty balanced between the two groups. That's what randomization does. Restriction, which was the answer to our previous question, is you limit those to only those meeting certain criteria. So in a lot of times, in a lot of studies, they'll limit individuals to only those that they want to test within that group of severity. So for this case, it was asthma. They only wanted to evaluate people with certain severities of asthma and only those who had undergone treatment with steroids, because this specifically was testing in people who have failed steroids, what, how does this drug work or how effective is this medication? And so that's why they restricted because they were only looking at a subset of patients that were only beyond a, a previous treatment. Then we have matching. So this is pairing individuals or groups of individuals so that the variables are distributed more evenly. So instead of randomizing them, you instead of saying, we're going to randomly hope that gender is split between group A and group B, you pair them together. So you pair a treatment group person and a control group person, and you say, are they the same in both gender, race, income level, the variables you want to say, so that you're essentially distributing the confounding variables between the two groups, but you're specifically choosing the individuals. So instead of it being randomized, they can still be randomized, but you're choosing the group or the individual based on similar confounding variables between those two individuals. Let's move on to the analysis portion. So stratification. So if you've ever seen a stratified analysis, you have the main analysis, then you have strata one and strata two. So stratify analysis is when participants are subgrouped according to a third variable. So let's say that third variable is gender, and let's say it's dichotomized into male and female. So the, the crude or the baseline analysis would be the outcome, whether that's asthma exacerbations. Then you would have a strata, asthma exacerbations in males and asthma exacerbations in females. And what you're doing is you're controlling for that variable itself, which in this case, we're talking about gender. And so you can analyze if that varies between the two strata, you know you have interaction there. If it doesn't vary, but it varies from the crude analysis, you know you have confounding. And if it doesn't vary at all, you know that there's no confounding or interaction. So that's what stratification is. Standardization is not one you see commonly because it's hard to test, but it's when you analyze data using a normalized reference population. So if you've ever heard of the term a standardized population, 
there's populations in previous history that have been standardized, and you can use those populations as a reference and compare to a standardized population to see if these confounding variables are approximately similar. And last but not least, we have multivariable regression. So this is a form of linear regression, and usually what you do is you plot the outcome on a line and you adjust for all of these confounding variables. So again, age, gender, income status, things like that, you can account for those and you basically remove them from their ability to influence and you still see if there's a linear association between the variables. So keep in mind, these are the ways that you can use to reduce confounding in a study. And the ones on the left are done in the study design. So as you're designing the study and planning the study and the ones on the right, you're doing as you're analyzing the data. So after the study's already been performed. Let's move on. So this is the last point here about interpreting statistical significance. This was the last question in this series of problems. So you always, always, always want to reference p-values or confidence intervals. That's the first point and the first step in interpreting statistical significance. So the next point here, number two, is if you're not given additional information, you assume the alpha level is less than 0 0.05, which is essentially the same thing as a p-value less than 0 0.05 is significant. And for confidence intervals, it's the null value. So if you're comparing a difference, so the difference between asthma exacerbation rates, the null would be zero. If you're comparing a ratio, so it's comparing the ratio of exacerbations in treatment compared to placebo, you would use a null value of one because dividing anything by a number, the null would be a one versus when you subtract, which is a difference, you would look for zero being no difference. So you always want to have two as your reference point. What are you referencing? So that's what you're referencing in regards to p-values and confidence intervals. So point three here, when given p-values less than 0 0.05, assuming they don't give you a different p-value, you know that's statistically significant. And number four is when given in confidence intervals that don't include zero or don't include one, remember that varies upon the situation. You need to use your intuition there and know that if we're looking at a difference or we're looking at a ratio, then that's statistically significant. They will trick you many, many times over with various different ways, but always reference the p-values and the confidence intervals in the question to determine if anything is, has true statistical significance. The value, the actual estimate itself may look like, wow, the asthma exacerbations were greatly, greatly decreased. But if the p-value is not less than 0 0.05 or less than what they say that it should be in the question, then that's not statistical significance. They're just using that value to trick you. We always use these numbers to determine statistical significance in these studies. Okay, final points on abstracts here. So I have problems and solutions. So the first problem here is abstract questions can take up much more time than other questions on an exam. Most questions you have a sentence or two and maybe a small paragraph to read. You rarely have multiple, multiple paragraphs. So I always recommend flagging these questions and saving them until the end. If you do them in the moment, you may cost yourself time on other questions, rush through and pick prematurely on other questions. You may also find yourself rushing through the abstract as well. Next point here, much of the information presented in the abstract is extra and it won't help you answer the questions. So if you notice in the abstract before, many of that was extraneous. It was just talking about study design that wasn't necessarily relevant if we're asking three questions. So what I always recommend is read through the question first so you know what to search the abstract for, and then you can go skim the abstract for where that information is located if you need to do so. I typically recommend reading the question in its entirety and not skipping to the end, but abstract points, abstract questions are one that I, I typically make an exception for given the situation with abstract questions. The last point here is some of the questions in these abstracts will be standalone public health and biostatistics knowledge. So review this information for these questions specifically. It can be a little frustrating if you get to an abstract and they ask you a standalone question that has nothing to do with the abstract, but it's just solely testing your own individual knowledge. And that can happen sometimes as well. So that wraps up this video. That's all I have here. So again, drop a like and a comment below if you found this sort of content helpful, and we'll be sure to touch on more similar content here in the future.